As a CEO, you're facing a very competitive environment today. It's not that the world is going to change, it's the world has changed. And I'm not speaking just of the economic climate, the situation that's happening in regards to an economic crisis right now. I'm speaking very specifically about some underpinning realities that are going on around the world that are going to force you to make a change. Let me tell you about the change and then let me tell you why you're going to need to make this. The CEO shift is about what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to make a market shift, a growth shift, a speed shift, a talent shift, and a leader shift. Let me tell you a bit about that real quick so you can get the picture here. If we look quickly around the world, what we're going to realize is, is we live in an entirely new era now. We live in an era, I suppose we could call it peopleization. Simply the sheer mass of people on the earth is entirely different than we've ever faced in history before. As a result of that, there's an imbalance of elements as we've once known them. Centers of power have shifted, um, economies are looking different, what's taking place has moved around, and what we need to be doing is pausing as business leaders, looking at it and saying, what does this mean for me? What do I need to be doing? So if I'm sitting right now in a Euro-American culture, I'm sitting in a company there, and I've been growing at a steady pace for all of these years, I may want to think for a moment and go, I could continue that, but the likelihood is, is you're probably not. Because of this era of peopleization and where the new centers of power are, where the new, the new locus of control per se is, you're going to need to be taking a look and saying, if I really want to grow, if I really want to achieve, if I want to succeed, what am I going to do? And as a result of that, you have to move from where you are, which is the market shift. In addition to that, you're going to have to change what growth means to you. I really don't need to articulate much on this point right now because I know for a fact, as well as you do, you're struggling with your talent equation. You're struggling with what to do to get people, to develop people, to grow people. You're going to need to make a shift because obviously, according to the own research that CEOs and business leaders are giving, you're struggling with your talent management issues right now. So what you're doing definitely is not working. And because that's not working, you need to make a shift. And then the final point is a leader shift. The style of leadership that is going on right now in the Euro-American cultures will not carry you as you go into the future. So what is it? It's about making five shifts. Why do you need to do it? Perhaps the simplest word is survival. If you really want to survive, you need to make the CEO shift. So there I am, I go to the doctor's office. I'm sitting down and we're checking everything. My heart's beating, my reflexes work, my ears, I guess, are clean or whatever they check. My tonsils are the right shape. And then all of a sudden the doctor says, I want you to sit down and cover your left eye and I want you to read this chart on the wall. So I sat down, I covered my left eye and he points to this line. He goes, Tommy, can you read it? What line? So he points to the next line up. I'm going, I have absolutely no idea. And he points to the next line. I'm like, I have no idea. And he points to the top line, and I happened to just know it was E, so I kind of cheated. But I turn and I'm like, letter E. He's like, oh, now let's do the right eye. So we go through the same exercise again. I get to the top line, and he turns to me and he says, I've got bad news for you. You're nearly blind. Now, a soon-to-be fifth grader, I don't know if you could have worse news in the world, okay? All that came into my head is four eyes, Tommy. I was absolutely sure I was going to have a brand new nickname, Four Eyes Tommy. And it's kind of interesting, up to this point in life, I didn't know some things. I thought in fourth grade that we rotated seats in the class so everybody would have an opportunity to actually see what the teacher wrote on the board. So I thought that when you sat on the front row, it was your week to read, and when you sat on the back row, it was your week to play. <laughs> Later, my mom took me to Dr. Whalen's office, and inside there, or Dr. Schubert's office, and inside there, we were going to get the glasses. And again, I'm telling you, inside, this is the worst news possible for a kid. You're going to be four eyes, you're going to wear glasses, absolutely horrible news. So we walk inside there, and these brown bionic glasses, you know the ones that you could bend straight, they had just been released. I thought, at least if I'm going to get glasses, let me get these cool brown bionic glasses. And I will never ever forget looking up and going, oh, 
Mom, look, there's words on the sign. There's birds in the trees. And all of a sudden, I began to see things in an different, entirely different way than I ever had before. And you know, as we're sitting here today and we look out around the world, it's pretty darn different. When I look at it the way I grew up, and I look at it today with my brown bionic glasses on, I realize it's considerably a different world. While the West is sleeping, the entire rest of the world is working. What does that mean for you as a business? It means you need to make a market shift. As I share these statistics, these facts, I want you to really kind of sit back and relax for a moment because some of them are quite startling. You may be a little bit skeptical. They're intriguing. And some people are possibly going to be a little scared as we take a look at these statistics and we start thinking about what's going on in the market shift. But I want to draw your attention to four key points. The first one is, it's fairly obvious, okay? The world is getting bigger. Okay? Fairly obvious, right? But let's really think about the rate the world is getting bigger. The world is growing, are you ready for this, by 8,000 people per hour. To put that in perspective for you, we could replenish the entire workforce of Walmart in 10 days. The world is substantively changing. It is incredibly different than it used to be. The world, obviously, is getting bigger. But the world is substantially bigger than it once was. We add a billion people every 14 years to the population of the world. In my grandmother's lifetime, which she was born in 1920, we have grown from just under 2 billion to 6.8 billion, and we're continuing to grow rapidly. And by 2012, they're projecting that the world's population will be 7 billion people. The world is getting bigger. The world is becoming Eastern. People are moving, uh, not just moving, the growth of the world is happening in the Eastern provinces. We no longer live in an era of the West. The Western dominance of the world is, is gone. When you start thinking about the growth that is taking place and we start looking at what's happening and the shapes and the development of what is taking place there, there's a disproportionate growth going on. But it's projected that between 1950 and 2050, the Euro-America will grow by 350 million people. And during the exact same period of time, the emerging markets will grow by 6.8 billion people. Right there, you can begin to understand how small and shrinking the population pool is here and how large the population pool is growing in the emerging markets. The third statistic is the world is becoming urban. Uh, to me, this is one of the greatest moments for business when you think about this. 52% of the world lives in a city of a million or more people right now. 52% of the world. But there's only 496 cities that have a million or more people. So as a business, I could reach half of the world, literally half of the entire world, by going to just 500 locations. These are common sociological trends that we don't think much about in the business sector. But if I'm sitting where you are as a CEO, I should be scratching my head right now and really beginning to ask myself, what does this mean? I think this means something for me. The world is bigger. The world is Eastern. The world is urban. And interesting enough, the world is becoming poor. Today, 1.3 billion people live on less than $2 a day in the cities. 1.3 billion people live in the cities on less than two dollars a day and that happens to be interesting enough it's the largest consistent market group in the world and the fastest growing so right now as they make the journey from the rural side into the city they are joining the urban poor Procter & Gamble has figured out that on two dollars a day it's relatively difficult to afford to buy a box of Tide detergent or Ariel detergent correct that's a pretty, that all of a sudden that becomes a big ticket item to purchase. They have figured out though that they can sell a single sachet, one packet of laundry detergent for a single load, and people can afford that on $2 a day. So all of a sudden, Procter & Gamble has moved into a market that they were outside of. Tang, the orange drink people, 
Again, buying a jar of Tang would be a relatively large purchase on $2 a day. But they have figured out that they could put it in a single straw, and you can go in at any moment, buy the straw with the Tang in it, and put it in whatever your liquid source is, drink it, and you now have an orange flavored drink. People are beginning to figure out that there's a market there. In years to come, quite frankly, the largest markets in the world, okay, the, the largest economic markets in the world will not be the richest. We will no longer be operating in the same ways that we have been operating in the past. We're going to begin to see major changes of what's going on as we move into the emerging markets. I guess the question, though, that's probably looming in our heads is, but how do I actually make the market shift? Recognizing the world is bigger, it's eastern, it's urban, and it's poor, how do I, act, how do, I do it? To begin with, you have to think differently. You have to really change the way you're thinking, change the way that you're looking at life. Again, our business practices are industrial in root. Our management practices, our business models have a very industrial nature to them. We have a very logical pattern, conceptual thinking, very concrete, very orderly environment. We are industrialists. But over in the emerging markets, all of a sudden we find out that these markets come from a family basis. They're not developed in the industrial area. They're family businesses that have grown and expanded. If you want to make the market shift, you have to move your resources from here and change your allocation to there. But as we sit here, we really need to be asking, and it's a very personal question. The CEO shift is very, very personal to you as a business leader. And what we need to be asking is, what exactly does this mean to me and to my business? Interesting enough, there's an emerging market company called Oriental Weavers. You probably don't know them by that name, but they're the largest rug manufacturer in the world. They supply more rugs in the United States than any other competitor. They're sitting in Egypt, they're manufacturing rugs for the United States, market's doing great, company's doing fantastically well, and they announced that they're going to open an office, they're going to open a factory in China. I naively said, why in China? Don't you have a low labor rate in Egypt? And they said, we're not going to China for the labor rate. We're going to China because of the growth potential. As a CEO, you need to make a growth shift. So I had in sixth grade this chance to go to the big city of Chicago. So we're riding up there, the group of us boys, and we take I-57, we get to Chicago, and the very first place we go to is the Sears Tower, and staring at the 108-story tall Sears Tower, and peering up at it, thinking, oh my goodness. We walked inside the lobby of it, and the lobby of the Sears Tower is taller than the tallest building in my hometown. And we got in the elevator and we took the lift on up to the top and we got to the observation deck. This happened to be one of those days where there were light clouds and they were low. So we walked out on the observation deck and we looked down and we were on top of the clouds. I'd never been in an airplane before. And all of a sudden I'm standing there and I'm looking down from the top of the Sears Tower and I thought to myself, this must be what it feels like to be God. To be able to look down and to peer through all of this and just standing there and staring down. And at that point, the Sears Tower, this is in the 1970s, was the tallest building in the world. And in my head, the Sears Tower stayed the tallest building in the world. As the other, a few other buildings were coming online, didn't think much about it. In the year 2000, there were six buildings in the world that had 100 floors or more. Five of them were in America. In 2008, there are 19 buildings in the world that are either developed, completed, or under construction right now that will have 100 floors or more. 15 of those 19 buildings will be in the emerging markets. Growth is very different on the global front. Where do you find the largest mall in the world today? It's not in the States anymore. Where do you find the tallest building? Where do you find the largest growth in high net worth individuals? Where do you find the largest tourist attraction? Where do you find the largest entertainment piece now? Bollywood is larger than Hollywood. If you want to find the biggest 
and the largest, you no longer look to the West. Growth has drastically changed. And what we need is a new definition of growth. If you want to make the CEO shift, you need to change what growth means to you. Two, three percent growth isn't going to take it anymore. If we just stop and look at a simple fact for a moment, okay? Euro-American cultures in recent history have been growing by a two to three percent growth rate. Businesses, typically if they double that or triple that, they think they're doing fantastically well. That's probably what you're doing. If you hit 10% growth, you're celebrating. You're having a fantastic uh, bonus era. You're getting the maximum rewards you can. But if you look to the emerging markets, you find that their compounded growth rates are at 40%. How do you justify to your stockholders? How do you justify to your shareholders? How do you justify to your public that you're growing at 7, 8, 10% when you could be growing at an astronomically different rate? You need to change what growth means to you. You need to make a growth shift. Quite frankly, you don't have any time. We need a new definition of what growth is. Times have changed. We need to look at it in a different way. We need to realize what big is today and how things have taken a very different perspective. I know as a CEO, you want to know how to make the growth shift. Nearly every study that comes out, one of the top two things that CEOs are losing sleep at night over, one is talent, and number two is how to grow the top line. So number one is change your definition. You literally need to change the definition of what growth is. Number two is you need a new catalyst for what your growth is. What's causing your growth? Where does your growth come from? You need to change what that catalyst is. You need to change what's creating it and what's driving your growth. I mean, on September 8th in Financial Times, it talks about the Lehman Brothers is going to restructure so that they can refocus outside the U.S. Well, we all know what happened a few weeks later. They were not fast enough. They did not have the speed that is necessary to make it. They needed to have a speed shift. The speed shift basically is saying you need to go faster. You need to pick up your speed of business. The rate of growth in the world right now is not leaving you the luxury of going slow or at an average speed. It is, insinu it is, is demanding that you pick up your speed and go faster and faster and faster. We are living in an era right now that you could call the Autobahn of business and it's time for you to operate your business as though you're driving on a German highway. I think we need to understand what stands in our way of speed because in Euro America we have a lot of speed bumps. We get a lot of speeding tickets in our business environment today. We have words like control. Our chairman, our CEOs, our executives like control. And as I take control, I am literally the speed bump of my company. When I try to hold on to it and keep it in my fingers, I am slowing my business down. I have to learn how to let go of things so we can have the speed. Another aspect in regards to that is, quite frankly, it's government regulation. Goldman Sachs did a report recently, and it reported back out that CEOs are very concerned about overregulation and the impact it's having on the speed of their business. If I start thinking about where government regulation comes in and what it does, globally speaking, how it slows business down. Legislation comes into the place and slows us down. For taxation slows us down. It makes us make decisions that we would to operate inside this frame, inside a particular speed range. We want control on it. And quite frankly, governments do it often because they want controlled growth. Governments, there's an economic philosophy that most of the Euro-American governments will operate by, that they want a controlled rate of growth economically. And the reason for that is, is they don't want the problems that could come from explosive growth. So they try to control that growth, and then they push elements back into the business. The government comes in and decides they're going to help, and all of a sudden we just slowed business down. 
major speed bump going on inside business right now. So we have control, we have government regulation and taxation and legislation. Another one is competition slows us down. Interesting enough, the reason competition slows us down is they may not be as good as us. Our competition may have a growth range that's lower than the growth range we need. And as a result of that, we end up growing at a lower level than we need to because we're looking at who our competitors are. We're looking across that landscape and all of a sudden we're saying, well, okay, I did better than they did, but is better than they did the rate of growth that we could be operating at. Competition slows us down. So here we are, we're beginning to understand what the speed bumps are, what the speeding tickets are. But on the other side, let's figure out how do we drive on the Autobahn of business? It's kind of interesting. To drive fast in a car, there's a few basic things that need to go on. One, you have to have a fast car, right? Okay, so once we set the fast car aside, the second thing we have to do is, interesting enough, know the road. If I drive fast and I don't know the road, I crash. Fair? I, I can give very good stories of that um, from a teenage day. But the better I know the road, the better I can, or the quicker I can drive. So what we have to do is if we want to drive fast, we have to know the landscape and we have to know the terrain of where we're going to go drive. So if I'm going to drive fast and I'm realizing that the growth is happening in the emerging markets and I'm moving into that area, I have to figure out how do I drive fast in the emerging markets. So I have to know what does it mean to be here? What is the speed that is happening here? Why else do emerging markets go fast? And we kind of sit back and we say, why? Why would they adopt ideas quicker than the Euro-American cultures would? Ideally, because the Euro-American culture has been disciplined to be constrained. When there's a red light at the crosswalk and no cars coming, do you cross the road? If you're living, growing up in Euro-American country, you've got the little guys red, and we stand there nice and polite, and we push the button. No cars, we wait. We have been constrained to be disciplined, or we've been disciplined to be constrained and held back. We hold ourselves back. We wait for the light to change, and then we can cross the road. There's an old African proverb. It says, if you're a gazelle, and you wake up in the morning, all you need to do is run faster than the fastest lion or you'll be eaten. If you're a lion, all you have to do is run faster than the slowest gazelle or you'll starve. So when you wake up in the morning, it doesn't make any difference whether you're a gazelle or a lion. You better be running fast. In today's day, if you want to survive, you better make the speed shift. I think you know the problem. Matter of fact, when you woke up in the middle of the night last night, I think you were struggling with this. As a CEO, I am sure that you're absolutely convinced that you've got talent issues you need to solve. As you sit there and you think about your talent equations and what you've been doing, obviously it's not working or you wouldn't be waking up in the middle of the night with these kinds of struggles. So what you need to do is you need to make a talent shift. You need to change the way you're approaching talent so that you can survive in this era of business, so that you can make the CEO shift. If you want to win in the emerging markets, quite frankly, if you want to win in any market, at this point, it is not that dependent on the emerging markets. It's dependent on your business survival and your business ability. Because if you're in the West right now, you're facing an aging workforce. If you're in the emerging markets, you're facing, facing different talent issues. But right now, for you to survive, you need to make a talent shift. There's a phrase that we've all come to know quite well in the business sector, and it's the talent war. But as we stand here today, I want to tell you, honestly, the talent war is over. The war for talent is absolutely 100% over. Unfortunately, though, talent won, and the business is lost. We're sitting here, we're fighting a talent war, talent has won, and the businesses have lost. And you may say, how, how can you actually say 
that that is true. Number one, short tenure. When we start counting job tenure in months instead of years, we begin to realize the talent war is over. I've got a good friend. He's 33 years old. He's worked in five countries and six companies. And one of his companies just hired him back, which gave him that. So he's doing a good enough job in the companies that he's getting progressive promotions each time, moving up the ladder at 33 years old, five countries, six different companies. Tenure is short. It used to be we would read CVs and we want to see three to five years. Now we're beginning to see things like nine months, 18, nine, 12, 18 months in job tenure. And people are moving. They're changing jobs. I watch people all of the time walk into one job and six months later they're moving on. They're expecting a new job. Job tenures have changed. When an employee can make those decisions, we know they're in control. Not only that, we have out of control pay inflation. I mean, pay inflation is absolutely out of control these days. I knew a guy, he was, what would he have been, about 38 years old, and somebody offered to triple his salary. Triple his salary. Okay, he was in a management level job, 38. Within seven months of working at that company, his salary doubled again. A year or so later, he was offered a job outside, doubling his salary again. So in a year and a half to two year period of time, I have absolutely no idea what the math of that is, but his salary tripled, doubled, and doubled. And unfortunately, that's becoming common. We're beginning to see in emerging markets that kind of pay increase where the pays are just either absolutely out of control as they jump forward. As business leaders, we need to understand the talent war is over and accept the new reality. But unfortunately, many of us are going back to our old ways and we're trying to implement those and live in an old reality. And what we have to do is say, no, that is not the way to do it. To make the talent shift, I have to go to a new reality. The difficulty is getting to a new reality for a senior business leader is very difficult because typically what we do is our business practices are we copy what we did before. And there's no place that's more true than in our talent equations. CEOs and top executives, when it comes to talent, they practice what they've been doing for years, keeping it going the same way, assuming it's the best. One approach is that we could be on the far other side and think differently, and we need to approach our workforce as a permanent, temporary workforce. A permanent, temporary workforce is it's very similar to a relationship with a consultant. Okay, when I hire a consultant as a business, I am basically defining outputs, outcomes that I'm after, a time frame, and a price. So as a permanent temporary workforce, what I need to do is I need to realize I'm going to lose employees. They're not going to be with me forever. So I need to lose this thought of employment for life, and I need to begin to realize that my employees are only with me for a duration. So what the, I need to be thinking is, what is the duration they're most likely going to be with me for? Then I need to set specific outcomes I'm after, and inside that, what I'm willing to pay to get those particular outcomes for that very specific amount of time. The reality is, it does, quite frankly, it doesn't matter where you are, employment of life is a thing of the past. I need to begin to think, how am I going to match my business model to it? So I'm addressing you, though, like you're a full-time employee. You're an employee of my company, but I'm being honest. I'm being real that I know you're going to leave one day. So what I'm trying to match is how long you're going to be there with what I'm asking for you and how I can drive that forward. Employees are thinking defined periods of time for their employment. They're walking into jobs thinking that way, but companies are still over here on this side thinking, employment for life. Western-oriented companies are going, no, come join us. You can be our employee for life. We have this great engagement program. We have this for you. We have this for you. And I don't even think they hear it. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, I'll be here for a year, and then after that. So what we need to do on this side is match our thinking to that. So we need to walk in thinking defined period of time. Traditionally, in emerging markets, typically, I shouldn't say traditionally, typically in emerging markets, employees stay for at least 12 months. Okay? 
at least 12, maybe to the 14, a few may fall under it. So I'm thinking 12 months. So when I'm hiring somebody, what I need to be thinking is, what do I want out of you in a 12 month period of time? What contribution do you need to make in a 12 month period of time? What am I as a company willing to give in exchange for that? If that matches, make the transaction. Then, once they're an employee, I can begin to do things to try to lengthen that approach, to lengthen the time. But to start the equation, I need to work from a permanent, temporary workforce, realizing you're going to be here for a short period of time. Leader shift. It's very clear that you're going to have to make a shift in your leadership style. Why? Well, let's look back at this. A market shift, a growth shift, a speed shift, and a talent shift, you're not going to be able to make that without changing the way you lead. The style, the approach, the methods, the history, pretty much everything that has been written about leadership needs to be put back on the bookshelf and you're needing to make a leader shift. And the reason for that is these markets are different. Quite frankly, the leader shift is probably the hardest shift to make. It's going to be very, very difficult to do it. I'll take you a little journey around the world and kind of explain this point. It was 1996, and the very first place I went to outside the U.S. was Manaus, Brazil. I remember getting to Manaus, Brazil, and you know there was a lot of things I had never thought about before. I had never thought about an airport may be different. Now I realized that food would taste different. I realized that people would speak a different language, but I didn't really think about that the noises in society would be different. I didn't think about the way you shop would have a different dynamic to it. I definitely didn't think about that people would smell differently. Um, I really wasn't braced for that, and I began to realize these differences. But what happened is, is from there, I went to Beijing, China. And in Beijing, I realized that they're different again. There's still smells, taste, all of these pieces, but great differences again of what's going on. And I began to understand there's not a global style. There really is not a global style to life. And when we come to leadership though, we begin to teach that there's a global style of leadership. But if you think about it though, most of the global styles of leadership we teach are Western-based styles which are based in conceptual thinking, vision orientation is a communication mechanism. We can go down this list we have here, but over here, they don't think conceptually. It's not about vision. Vision is about the company. It's about my opportunity. Remember, I'm leaving in a year. I care about my opportunity. So you begin to the shifts that are going on or changes between these. And then there's a big, I mean, an enormous difference between them. So we try to like superimpose on this, this idea of here's the super dynamic global leader who can lead anywhere. Where is the guy? We have the model, but where's the leader? I'm still looking for it. You see, we have these models that we build over here that are supposed to make these dynamic, super global leaders. But when I go out in the world and I start looking for super global leaders, I don't find them. Now, I find people who can lead inside P&G that are doing it as an expat in a multinational. But I haven't seen the guy that leave P&G and do it in the super global environment yet. I see people who come from like the GEs that are great GE leaders, but I don't see them step out and become great global leaders. I see them become very good at taking this model and utilizing it. And the reason for it is it's not P&G, it's not GE, it's not the company's models. That's not the problem. It's not the leader's problem. The problem is the construct's wrong. There's not a global style of leadership. However, there is an approach that works in the emerging markets. There's a very distinct approach to emerging market leadership that needs to be taken into consideration. Number one, imagination. 
You need to have a thinking style of imagination. You need to be looking different, drawing connections, pulling pieces together that you never did before. The answers, the solutions, they're not sitting in front of your face in a logical format. There's, you're going to have to make sense of this world in a different way. Number two, navigation. Unfortunately, the emerging markets are not clear. They're not orderly. They're not structured in the way that you as a Euro-American are accustomed to. They don't operate with the same rhythm. They don't operate with the same cadence. So what you're going to have to do is develop the skill of navigation, being able to, to give directions to your people, show them where to go, help them get through the clutter and the chaos that they're faced with. Number three, you need to learn how to be multilingual in one language. You've got to learn how you can speak in such a way to where you're understanding and where you are understood. This is quite difficult to do. Oftentimes we approach markets with somewhat of a colonial approach. Our way is better. We have the answers. When we walk in with that kind of thinking, we don't hear what's really being said. We need to make sure not only are we being heard, but we need to make sure that we're understanding what's going around us as well. Number four, magnet. You need to be like a magnet, a place to hold your employees in, a place to create belonging, an environment. You've got to understand your role as a leader in this, where you play, what you need to be doing. Number five, rapid talent development. We've already heard that how the rapid promotions, the short tenure, what's going on in the business sector. What you need to do now is figure out how to spot talent very young and develop it in an exponential factor. Rapid talent developments, it's not like an accordion. I hope you're not thinking that you can take your old leadership approach and just condense it down like an accordion and push all of the air out of it and try to do that approach. Think about this. When you push the air out of an accordion, does it make any noise? It only makes noise when it's aired out. So it isn't condensing what you're doing. Rapid talent development's not about condensing, it's about creating an entirely different approach to talent development. And then number six, achievement builder. You need to understand how to build achievement in an emerging market. It's not the same as execution in a Western market. Achievement builder in emerging markets are fundamentally different. This is your secret. The leader shift is your secret, but it's also the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life. But to make the CEO shift, to be successful, to implement this, to do this, you're going to have to make the leader shift. The emerging markets are today's reality. And if I could give any advice, I would say you need to go to your eye doctor and you need to get a pair of brown bionic glasses, like I did as a kid. You need to put them on and realize how different the world really is and you need to go make the CEO shift.